um, inside uh, with audience on one side and the play happening on the other. And then I also work in the world of interdisciplinary collaboration and um, site specific work. So uh, with my company Pearl Demore, uh, my collaborator Katie Pearl is a director and I'm Lisa Demore. We put our last names together to form a company. And our next piece is actually going to happen outdoors in a meadow uh, at Longwood Botanical Gardens, which is just outside of Philadelphia. Um, I'm a native of Louisiana, and I do a lot of work uh, in New Orleans, which is my hometown. Um, so I'm really glad to be here. And maybe we could start with Chantal. Could you talk a little bit um, about your work, and maybe a little bit about how your life has um, led you to take on environmental issues? Yes, and I'll try the no microphone approach too, and if I'm not loud enough, I'll use the microphone. So my name is Chantal, and I'm a, a playwright translator, originally from Montreal, but I've been living in, in uh, New York for uh, almost 15 years. I, uh, I'm involved with two uh, long-term projects that are, dif uh, that are um, particularly relevant to uh, the conversation tonight. One is called The Arctic Cycle, it's a series of eight plays that examine the impact of climate change on the eight countries of the Arctic. So um, the first play was performed uh, last year in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's called Sila, and it's set in uh, the Canadian Arctic. And the second play, called Forward, is set in Norway. And um, I've been, it's still in development. I've been developing it over the past two years. I was in um, Norway in January working on it with a theater company there. And it's going to be presented at Kansas State University in February of next year. And I started this project several years ago um, after going to Alaska and sort of encountering firsthand the effect of climate change, especially uh, with the glaciers. This was um, just slightly after Al Gore's movie An Inconvenient Truth came out. And I, so the climate change conversation was becoming a lot more mainstream. And there's some places in Alaska where you, the, the, the glaciers, the lines where the glaciers used to be is very well marked. So you can walk the distance between where the edge of the glacier was 100 years ago, 50 years ago, up to where it is today. And it's a very um, visceral ex uh, experience, a lot more than just reading the data or looking at a graph. So after, after that experience, I started thinking about maybe being able to address this issue in my work. And, uh, bringing to people who were not able to have that same experience a taste of, of what it's like to really um, uh, see and feel the, the changes. And then the second project I'm involved with uh, is an extension of the first one because as I started um, thinking about climate change from an artistic point of view, I wondered who else was doing the same thing. And I couldn't find very many people in my immediate environment. So I created this blog called Artists and Climate Change, and where I'm trying to gather um, artists from all disciplines and all regions of the world who are addressing um, climate change in their work. And, and so, and then I created a Facebook group, and so it's sort of um, this big network of artists who can now communicate with each other and um, share what they're doing. Um. <laughs> I'll give it a try too without the uh, My name is Michael Leon Guerrero. I am a, currently the national coordinator of uh, an alliance called Climate Justice Alliance, uh, which is about 41 organizations uh, throughout the country uh, working, uh, doing environmental justice work, but also addressing um, the issue of the climate and economic crisis. Um, my background is uh, actually, it's interesting because I started in art. Art was actually where but I originally studied music, really, and then uh, visual arts. Um, studied at the University of California, Berkeley, and also uh, for a short while in Mexico City. And so I've always had a really kind of a, a real interest in the intersection between art and politics, and, um, and the role of art and music in, uh, in social movements. And um, when I came back from Mexico City, was, this was during the time of the interventions, uh, the wars of intervention in Central America uh, by the United States. So I was active in the uh, Central American Intervention Movement. And uh, when I came back to the United States, got involved in community organizing uh, and was went through a training program that placed me in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, where pretty much I've been for the last 30 years 
Palestine since then. And it was right at the time when a lot of these issues were starting to surface around what was then being uh, framed as environmental racism. And the fact that uh, we were working in a number of communities that were uh, experiencing toxic poisoning, we were seeing high uh, rates of asthma and cancers, and um, you know, finding things like uh, uh, workers that were working in high-tech electronics industries that were literally dumping their hands in chemicals like trichloroethylenes and all these different things that were causing severe health effects. So we did a lot of work with those communities at that time, uh, both with private industries and also military toxics, um, nuclear issues, all, all, all kinds of things. And so for me, the environment and getting involved in environmental issues was more, it was more about the people. That's, that was my entry point. And experiencing and working with those communities um, that were really directly impacted and suffering these health impacts, that ultimately were really economic decisions. And so that led, led us on a trajectory. I was working with the Southwest Organizing Project at the time that got us into economic development. And because we realized that environmental issues are the consequences of economic decisions. And more and more, that led us into global issues, because then we were seeing the role of corporations and how the role that they were playing in trying to deregulate um, and um, uh, cut back on environmental regulations and what those impacts were on communities. So that got us involved then and got me involved personally uh, in what became known as the Global uh, Justice Movement. Uh, that was really sparked in a lot of ways first by the North American Free Trade Agreement and later by the Battle of Seattle. Um, so I got active in a process where I actually ended up meeting Melanie for the first time uh, through the World Social Forum, and I actually I uh, went through that process too. And, um, and uh, we organized things like U.S. social forums that brought together social movements to, to talk about how we're going to change our economy and change our, our, our world uh, ultimately in the future. Um, and then that led me into the realm of climate because that's where we're seeing now um, how the environment and economics are starting now to come together. Um, where we're experiencing crises in both our climate, our environment, um, and the economy. And so that's what the organization I work for now, it focuses on that. It's, what is that intersection? How can we actually rebuild our communities uh, in a way that sustains life and also deals with climate? And so that's the focus of uh, the work that we're and then lastly, it's become a, more of a, on a personal level. Uh, my family is from the island of Guam, which is in Micronesia, um, and that's in the northwestern region of the Pacific. Uh, 2,000 islands spread over the, an area the size of the United States, the largest of which is Guam, which is only eight miles by 32. And so I had the opportunity recently to actually visit a number of the islands that a uh, number of them are already at risk because of climate change and, and dealing with the effects of that. So, um, we have a lot to lose in terms of our culture, our history, uh, our land, and our people. And so, um, it's a very personal uh, issue in this uh, one. Uh, my name is Papu Solon. I am from Bolivia. Uh, uh, but I'm coming now from Thailand because I have been in the last three years the executive director of Focus on Global South an activist think tank organization that is based in Bangkok but has offices also in India and the Philippines. Uh, before that, I was the ambassador of Bolivia to the United Nations and chief negotiator on climate change for Bolivia. Uh, so how did I get involved? I would say I was always a social activist. But with the environment, I would say my first relation was with the water war. Uh, and uh, with climate, when we came into the government, was how to respond to this issue, to this negotiation. One, well, I think, of the most interesting things was to organize the People's World Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth in 2010 in Bolivia. And uh, to follow up, that experience has led me to many conclusions that I will share with you today. Just one last thing, you know. Uh, when it comes to art, my I'm the son, maybe I should have presented it that way, you know. I'm the son of a muralist, a social muralist, very famous. If you speak about Siqueiros in Mexico, Diego de Rivera, for Bolivia, my father is a muralist like, like that. So 
through art, we have been always been linked to social activism. Um, it's really inspiring to see the three of you sitting up on stage, but then to hear about these networks that you've created that reach out far beyond this room. And um, one of the things that I've been asked to kind of start off our conversation um, may seem preposterous, but it's to um, see if we can put together like a five minute crash course on the prevailing discourse around climate change. <laughs> uh, so we'll see if we can do it. Maybe I'll start my watch. Um, but there's just, uh, there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of ideas around what the climate change crisis is. Um, and then there's a lot of misinformation as well, too. And I'm wondering if um, maybe if we could start with Pablo and Michael to just talk about maybe. Uh, some of the maybe mainstream ideas that are being put forward out there and some counter-narratives. What do you think? Um, well, the issue of, of climate change, no? from the perspective of the negotiations, and now this year is going to be the year of climate because there's going to be a big conference in Paris and they are going to agree on an agreement for the next, ten, for the next decade, until 2030. Uh, so what is happening? It is it, it is the story of a, of a person that has obesity and goes to the doctor, and the doctor tells that person, "You should stop eating and reduce what you're eating, or otherwise you're going to have a heart attack." But he comes months later and says. Look how I am. But you have to increase your weight. Instead of decreasing, you're gaining more weight. You're going to have a heart attack. And he responds, but now instead of eating nine hamburgers, I'm eating seven. So I'm better. So this is the climate negotiation. So we are getting worse. To put it in technical numbers, we should have begun to reduce greenhouse gas emissions globally last year if we want to be in a situation where we can control what's going to happen with the environment. But the current pledges of the US and China and the EU that are going to be put on the table in Paris show us that the greenhouse gas emissions will continue to increase until 2030. Increase? Increase. So, to put numbers, globally, 2012, we had 52, 53 gigatons of CO2 equivalent, all the greenhouse gases. And the different reports are saying, we're going to do a great job. We're going to be in 59 gigatons of CO2 equivalent by 2030. And you know, we should be, by 2013, 35. We should be, by the end of 2020, in 44. But we're going to be in 57. Now, negotiators call this, there is an emission gap. But we're doing fine, because we're reducing it. So, the situation is dramatic from a global perspective. And the problem of climate change is that you can do a great thing here and there, but if globally we're not able to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, the impact, the, the implication, the result will be worse than worse. So this is the situation. We are going to a climate uh, agreement in Paris that's going to be worse than the one that we had in Cancun. And in Cancun, uh, I was there in, uh, in the negotiation, and we, as Bolivia said, we don't accept this agreement. So we voted against the 192 countries. And why we voted against? Because the agreement was saying the following. From now on, everybody would do whatever they can. <laughs> So it's based on voluntary pledges. And we said, that way we're going to turn around. We have to have an agreement 
the test is target. We have to reduce until 44 until 2020. And then we have to agree how we are going to reduce the effort between each of the countries in order that we reach that target. Some will have to do more. Some are more responsible. Some have less capacity. Then we distribute. But we have a target. Now we're in a situation where you can put whatever you want on the table. That's your contribution, voluntary contribution. And then we see at the UN, hey, what is the final number? And the final number is a tragedy. So nobody wants to speak about numbers. Yeah. <laughs> I have a follow-up question for you. Uh, could, you could you uh, give us your perspective on what you're seeing as a dialogue in discourse? Um, I think there's a lot of dialogue in discourse. And, um, and also, I just also want to appreciate Pablo um, being here, because the role of Pablo and, uh, and Bolivia, and his role in Bolivia, uh, in the um, in the United Nations and in those negotiations was really was really critical. And uh, he mentioned Cancun, but also in, in the wake of Copenhagen, where um, basically negotiations were undermined, unfortunately, by President Obama swooping in literally at the last moment uh, from really reaching a concrete uh, agreement uh, for commitments to cut, cut emissions. And uh, that's uh, where the voluntary um, concept there was also introduced. And it was Bolivia at that moment that said, no, we're going to convene our own summit, which they did a year later um, in uh, Cochabamba, where the water wars took place. And, uh, and there was a whole uh, agreement, basically, of social movements that came out of that, the Cochabamba Accords, and I think they're really still um, a very inspirational document for us uh, to look at and, um, and adhere to. But, um, you know, and then there's, there's just contradictions, right, in terms of the behavior and what the um, uh, and what our, our uh, elected leaders are saying, right? I mean, when you see uh, the development of the, all of the infrastructure that's already being planned out, whether it's oil and gas pipelines that are going to traverse uh, North America, uh, whether it's deep sea oil drilling that's going to take place in the Gulf Coast or going to take place in, in in the Arctic, and the corporation that is lining up and they're ready to move in now um, and are already moving in uh, to build more infrastructure to dig out heavier, dirtier uh, types of energy. Fracking now is just taking place throughout uh, the continent, and that's a, a very, another dirty form of energy. Uh, tar sands, where they're basically just stripping the earth um, in, um, in Canada, um, and all the infrastructure associated with that. So all the heavy machinery that they're bringing in from Korea um, and building these massive highways that are moving that machinery up to Canada to strip the land and pipe it down to these, uh, you know, down to the Gulf Coast to these refineries that are now dealing with more dirty crude and explosions and accidents and spills that are happening more and more often. I mean, this is the reality of what we're dealing with, which is in total contradiction to what they're saying that things are getting better, when the reality is, is that it's not. And then what they're looking to as solutions are really not solutions at all. Fracking, which you're saying is a clean form of energy, uh, clean coal, which is a total oxymoron, where all it is is that they're injecting um, the pollutants into the ground and expecting that they're going to stay there. Uh, nuclear energy is also viewed as a clean option. And even incineration of waste is another clean energy option. Which uh, and, and, and organizations have worked to ban uh, waste incineration for the last 20 years successfully. And now that's being viewed as, um, as a real alternative. So, um, so it is. It's a total contradiction. And it's, uh, it's a way for corporations to find loopholes and governments allowing them to continue to do what they're doing, business as usual. Um, meanwhile, uh, the situation keeps getting worse and worse, and we're getting farther and farther away from what our commitments really should be to address the problem. Great. So what I'm hearing is that uh, the, the discourse that we all often get is, you know, we're working hard and making progress, but that the reality is don't trust that. <laughs> Don't trust it. Um, I have two two quick follow-up questions. The the Cochabamba is that right? agreement is that how is that something that we can read and have access to? And how do we how do we? How? There's still a website. There's still a website. There is a website. Great. Okay. Yeah, you, uh, just search for the uh, People's World Conference on Climate Change on the website, Mother Earth, and you will get to it. Yeah. Great. Okay, I just want to make sure we that. 
And I was wondering, uh, Pablo, and I have a question for you. Um, I'm almost afraid to ask this. Do you have an example of collaboration on a more global le level that has worked? Um, yes. Between and across countries. Well, yes, yes, yes. The, 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 the Montreal Agreement mm -hmm. to solve the crisis of the ozone layer has worked. Mm -hmm. No? There was the hole in the ozone layer was increasing because of the use of uh, different sprays, gases, and chemicals that are used for refrigeration. Mm -hmm. And there was an agreement uh, between countries. They agreed to reduce the, the consumption and production of those kinds of gases that were uh, affecting the solar, uh, the, the, the ozone layer. And it has worked, and it has improved. Uh, and in reality, at the beginning, in 1992, when the, uh, when the agreement was signed, the agreement of climate change, in reality, it followed the same example. So the idea was, OK, we did this with the ozone layer. We can do it with greenhouse gases. So they did an agreement that if you look at it, it's very similar to the other one. But it has not worked at all. Why? That is the issue that we have to discuss. I don't want to take more time. It has to do that the ozone layer is a gas that you can isolate in certain yeah, refrigerators, aerosols. But when you speak about greenhouse gas emissions, you're speaking about your car, you're speaking about your shoes because they use also fossil fuels, you're speaking about trains, transportation, you're speaking about land use, about forestry. It's everywhere. The economy is linked to the issue of this kind of greenhouse gas emissions. So you cannot use the same approach that you use for your zone for climate, because this time the issue is not an environmental issue due to a, a, a gas. In reality, the gas is not the cause. The gas is the effect of an economic system. And what you have to do to address is the economic system. If you don't change here, the gases will not change by itself. And that is something that I would say is now almost agreed by everybody, but the negotiations will follow the traditional path that leads to no one. Thank you. Uh, and it, it definitely seems like, um, you know, allowing the, that, that some kind of perception shift to allow people to really understand the action needs to be taken, you know, in final right now. And I know that's something that you both had in your art in terms of realizing, um, oh, I can't tackle this with the position of a traditional play. I've got to come up with a new structure within which to write so I can represent multiple perspectives. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you could just talk um, a little bit about that moment and uh, maybe about some success stories of seeing people um, learn through different art forms or different aesthetics. Um, yeah, so the first play <coughs> that's part of the Arctic cycle is called Sila, uh, like I said, and it's set in the Canadian Arctic. And um, I started, um, so I did a lot of reading before uh, I was going to write the play, and I had a vague idea of what I wanted to talk about. This was a time where there was a lot of talk about the opening of the Northwest Passage, which is um, in, in northern Canada, a maritime route that would allow boats to go um, from, from Asia to Europe, is that right? Faster than having to go through the, the Panama Canal if that, that passage becomes ice free in the summer. And um, so my idea was, was that if that opens up, it's, it's going to create a lot of changes for the Inuit communities who live in that region because um, there's going to be good and bad, there's going to be a lot more environmental risk and a lot of disruption to their traditional way of, uh, ways of living, but also there's going to be um, economic benefits for populations who have almost um, no economy to speak of, uh, very few jobs. It's a very um, 
depressed uh, region because they um, that territory in Canada, which is called Nunavut, only become, became its own territory in 1999. So the government is still young. Um, they're, they're very much relying on the federal subsidies. And um, they need to, as, as we keep moving forward, they need to develop an economy. And what they do have is resources. So I thought, OK, so I'll probably write a play about who then, uh, an indig indigenous character who's, who's um, either fighting um, this you know, this, the opening of the passage, or uh, trying to um, make it happen in a way where it's it's not too disruptive. And and then I went on this trip to Baffin Island, which is part of Nunavut, and um, I realized that it, this was so much more complicated than <laughs> I first uh, uh, conceptualized it, and that. There were many, many interests uh, sort of um, intersecting, and that if I took, if I observed, if I talked about only one piece of the pie, I was do doing disservice to the people in the region because it would, because if you isolate one piece of the pie, it's easy to have an opinion about it, but it's not, um, you have to look at the whole, right? You have to, it's not, you can have a, you can be very radical about the environment if you don't understand what the economic uh, uh, problems are, or you can be very radical about the science if you don't look at the culture. And so I had to, when I came back from that trip, I had to completely um, rethink how I was gonna write this play, and I decided that in order to do justice to that story, it needed to have multiple voices, and it needed to have enough voices that um, I didn't feel like I was taking a side, and that I wasn't inviting the audience to take side. What I wanted to do instead was say, here, look at all this complexity, and then make your own opinion. You know, go find out more about one side or the other if you're, if you're interested, but what's most compelling is the, is the complexity. And the way we write plays, the way I learned to write plays, the traditional narrative model, which comes from Aristotle, is to have a, a character, a main character, who goes through a journey of um, learning or transformation, and goes through obstacles to uh, a point where something is resolved. And the other characters around that main character are usually in support of or in opposition to the main ideas that are being discussed. And um, I, I was uh, watching a presentation online uh, not too long ago, and this woman was talking about values in our, uh, the Western uh, philosophy, how that came from the ancient Greek, and how even if some of the details have changed, the main concept you know, for the, the past 2,000 years has remained the same, which is it's a hierarchical worldview. So it started with the, the, the Greek gods, there was a bunch of them controlling what was, was happening on Earth. And then that changed to one god, but it's still, you know, somebody at the top controlling. And now we have this capitalist system, which is very much a reflection of the same thing, which again is somebody at the top controlling the rest. And if that's how we write plays or how, that how we do art, we're, um, we're encouraging the same values. You know, we're reinforcing those same values. Um, it, um, something I found out also that was interesting was that perspective in the visual arts appeared at the same time as this Western philosophy with the ancient Greeks. So they were the, the first ones who started to um, uh, explore it, and then it, it, it blossomed it during the Renaissance. But perspective is, in fact, um, a single observer, and, and reality is for that observer. So it presupposes that there's, there's an objective reality, and that the, the person who observes is, it's like the, the world is arranged for God, right? What you see is arranged for one person. And that's also that's that same pyramid model. So I think I'm trying to to and I don't have the answer, but I'm trying to I'm searching in my plays from a playwright's point of view because there there are people who devise plays and who create the work in a very different way and they get to a very different result. But 
with a scripted play, like what kind of structure can I come up with, which takes us out of this um, hierarchical model and uh, promotes values that are more the kind of values that we need, this, this uh, collaboration and creativity and this um, model of the world that's more um, organic, you know, that's organized like, like biological systems are, are organized where there's no, I mean, there's nothing in our body that says to the organs, okay, you have to do this. It's like all interconnected and somehow it works. And that's, I think that's the kind of society that we need to move um, towards, you know, where there's, there's all these centers that are, that are communicating and um, collaborating with each other, but there's not so much so, it's, just, it's too complex now. They can't be one person at the top who's determining any, everything. So um, that's that's my search. <laughs> no, it's, it's very interesting because it's much easier to conceive of a body with a brain that's telling us what to do, and that's the easy way to think about it. Uh, and so a lot of what we're talking about is how to embrace the complexity of what's going on. Um, and I'm also hearing a lot about agency and economics too. And I'm so curious both about. I'm from Louisiana, I'm from New Orleans. I have many family members that have made their living in the oil industry. And in South Louisiana, we are, uh, so many people that I know adore the culture, the food, the music that has been created because of our Gulf Coast ecosystem. And yet, many of us are um, find ourselves trapped into working for the oil industry, which is part of what is destroying our coast. So it's this really weird double bond. And I'm very curious um, about how we start to untangle the economics and the environment need. Um, you know, uh, the, the only word that I can, I can start thinking about is, um, you know, taking huge risks of, of self-sacrifice and saying, well, I'm not going to do that job, job you know, which I, makes great sense to me in theory. <laughs> but then when it, when it turns into a practice of people trying to raise their families, it becomes a more emotional topic. And it seems like you encountered this in the village that you made. <coughs> so I wonder if we could just talk a little bit about um, how to untangle this economic environmental conversation. And, uh, and that may lead us to a conversation about agency, the agency of humans, and then the agency of Mother Earth, which I know is something that you've been very involved in. Does anyone want to? Well, it's, I think that was really fascinating in terms of the, um, the concept of the non-hierarchical. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the things that we talk about in uh, the work of the Climate Justice Alliance um, is this idea of local living economies. So we've started this campaign that we consider a long-term campaign about how do we actually transition our economy uh, in a way that it rebuilds our communities, that sustains life and heals the planet. And it's really, it's an economic agenda that's for things that are not really new, right? So renewable energy, um, uh, public transportation, uh, localizing agricultural systems, uh, restoring ecosystems. Um, you know, there's, this, there's so many things that we can do to create work, create livelihoods, and if we build up those sectors at the same time, we are sustaining life and human planet. And at the same time, we talk about that transition also having to be just. In other words, it has to be democratic. We also have to change uh, and transform our systems so that they are democratic. And so we feel that part of that solution is that the more local that these systems are, the more control people actually have and the more democratic they are. Um, so that's not saying that we're eliminating necessarily national governments, but that more local control and empowerment of communities to be able to so basically run our communities in, in ways that are sustainable, um, those are ways that we can be healthier. Because right now we are very dependent on these big mega energy systems and agricultural systems that are um, basically where con uh, contributing to uh, uh, polluting the planet. And so, so that's, that's one of the things. And we think that a lot of that ca capability now is within our hands. It's all within our reach to be able to do these things uh, today. The technologies are there. Um, and it's really just a matter of political <coughs> place. Um, yeah, the, the issue of greenhouse gases is very much linked to fossil fuel. And what uh, different researchers have said is that we need to leave 
under the ground 80% of known fossil fuel reserves. 80%. So, in the climate negotiations, they speak about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but they don't want to speak about limiting the extraction of fossil fuels. How are you going to get to an answer if you don't address this issue? Now, the question is, why this issue is not being put on the table? We all know that it has to do with fossil fuels. But there is no commitment to say, OK, let's limit the consumption of fossil fuels. Why is it? It's because the huge investment and capital that exists in those non-fossil fuel reserves. If we say, we're going to save the planet, and 80% of fossil fuels have to stay under the ground, Wall Street will collapse in one hour. Mm -hmm. Because much of the money that Wall Street is selling here and there is based on the assumption of the extraction in 20, 30, 40 years of that fossil fuel that needs to stay under the ground. So, of course, this is why these powerful sectors of corporations, of banks, have captured government. Actually, governments don't represent the need of the people. I'm convinced of that after being in this high negotiation. They represent mainly the interests of those corporations. And those corporations don't want to lose their money. They want to make more money. And it's true that they are going to suffer, but if they now accept something that would be correct, their business would collapse now. Now, they use some tricks, like they say, but what is going to happen to employ well, what you would say? And when was the, the time in the U.S. where there was more employment? I was surprised to read that it was during World War II. And that Detroit had full employment. And it was because employment was created not to trade, but to produce, at that time, weapons, tanks, and so on, to address the huge crisis of the war. Now we are facing an even bigger crisis than World War II, a planetary crisis. The states, governments, could use all the resources, as they did during the World War II, to create other kind of jobs. Jobs not for extraction of fossil fuels, jobs for restoration of Mother Earth. To restore our relation, to restore the damaged planet. So sources of employment are possible. We have to think on a different way, because until now, employment has been very much associated to industrialization, more extractivism, and there is no way. And they presented like there is a contradiction between trade unions that are defending employment and environmentalists that are thinking only on the environment. But in reality, we can act with the issue of employment and have full employment if we change the direction of what the employment is going to be for. So I think that unless we move, change totally the table around us, we're not going to solve this issue. And uh, of course, the resources are there. It is possible to do it. One final in relation to your question on mother, because climate change is an issue that deals with the economy that deals with politics, with democracy. If we don't recover our democracy that has been captured, I don't think how we're going to address climate change. But we also have to change the relation with nature. Because the nature in the current system is treated as an object, as a thing, as natural resources, as something that you use in order to make more money. It's a very anthropocentric view. We are in the center, the rest, exists only for our benefit and for the benefit of capital. 
So this relation with nature is another key aspect that very few speak about it. But if we don't do the change, a change also at this level, we're not going to be able to address the climate change. I'm wondering, I mean, it seems like, you know, sort of a, a, a miracle moment of epiphany <laughs> that there needs to be some sort of collective oh shit moment. Like, oh shit, we've gone too far, we have to change our ways. And that on a mic on like a global scale. <laughs> and I'm wondering, have, have, have any of you seen a, a, a micro version of that, a small community that realized we've gone too far with the way we're extracting fossil fuels or, or this industry is not working for us, we're going to change our way and the, our economy is going to be based on green technology. Or I'm just trying to think if there's any micro example that could serve as an example for a larger world. Someone said yes up here. Did you say that now? Okay. <laughs> we'll save it. You can tell us. Sorry. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't have an example of off the top of my head of a community that went, this has to stop. But after they have already gone too far in the opposite direction, I, I feel like I know examples of perhaps native communities that have always stewarded the land, do you know what I mean? But not the opposite of someone that has reversed their way. When it comes, for example, to communities that struggle against uh, mining extractivism because yes. they are suffering mm -hmm. the consequences, the pollution, and uh, they mm -hmm. see that their kids are dying because of that contamination, that pollution, and they say, okay, we have to close that mine or close that activity. Yes, they are. Uh, and I think that is one of the approaches. But the difficulty is that what you said in this case, it's not only about doing that at the local level, mm -hmm. but to be able to do it in a way that has a planetary scale. Mm -hmm. That is, I would say, the, the challenge. Yeah, I, I, similar to that, I mean, there are communities that are resistant. And um, that no, that things have gone too far because they're feeling the direct effects of that, and so they organize to, to change that. There are places where governments are, um, they're doing different things like promoting renewable energies. Germany's doing a lot of work in terms of transition to renewables. There are cities even in the United States, like Austin, Texas, that are setting much higher <coughs> ambitious goals to transition to renewable energy. So I think there are places where people are starting to say, yeah, things have gone too far. But I think there have been a ton of oh shit moments that just keep happening. When California now is basically got a year of water left. And at the same time, you've got Texas that, you know, eight inches in the month of May alone, enough water fell on Texas to cover the state in eight inches of water, right? And then there's Katrina and Rita and there's Superstorm Sandy. So there, there, there are tons of them just within the United States alone where we're seeing these oh shit moments, and you know, and it's um, again, it comes down to the political will and also ideology, right? And corporate profits, right? Which are behind a lot of the, the anti, um, you know, basically the rhetoric saying that climate change is not being caused uh, by humans. And so, uh, I think that's what we're up against. I think it's it's more political, uh, economic struggle around these things that are preventing. Um, uh, our governments, our leaders, our political leaders to actually take the steps that I think the majority of people are clear are necessary for us to have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, uh, I think wh why I ask that question is I, like a lot of people, feel overwhelmed, and, as I'm sure you all do too, by this issue. And so I'm, I'm curious um, if there are examples in your organizing or policy work about um, how to enter this conversation of what the individual can do and Chantal, I'm wondering if on your blog or with some of your collaborators, if you've been able to um, develop strategies um, towards action or, or towards dealing with um, some of the misinformation at scapegoating and paper pointing that goes on 
uh, which is really a way of keeping us all in it. It's always a struggle uh, for me to try to figure out what, like, there's to play, and then what's the next step after mm -hmm. that? How can I invite people to do things? And um, the play, so I, I didn't, I didn't, I wrote the play, but I'm not self-producing it. It's been produced by other theaters who have come up with their own strategies. And um, there was a lot of uh, talkbacks with uh, scientists and uh, policy makers and, you know, kind of like this with people who could um, point the audience in different directions. And um, in one case, there were also uh, local um, envi environmental organizations who would set up tables in the lobby and explain to people what they do. So if people wanted to join, they could get information right there. Um, I, I don't... Um, in any way try to educate people because it's, I don't think it's, well, first of all, I don't have the knowledge and I don't think it's my place to do that, but I certainly try to um, present stories that will then make people uh, want to go find information and, and get involved. Um, there's, there's this uh, woman I met recently, social scientist um, at the University of Oregon. Her name is Ka uh, Carrie Nordgaard, and she wrote uh, this book called Living in Denial. And it was her dissertation um, which she published. It was a study she did in, in Norway where she, uh, where, uh, you know, people are very educated, very aware of climate change, and but there's a resistance to talk about it. So it's not so much denial as, as it doesn't exist, but just it's a little too overwhelming and people don't want to talk about it. And what she discovered was that um, meaningful engagement was the antidote to that. So, you know, you, of course, any individual is not going to change the laws of a country, but if you can engage in something at your level that makes a difference at your level, then there's, there's, I think it changes the concept and, and we feel less helpless. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts for your organizing or policy making that has um, uh, helped you to lead to concrete action or um, kind of like uh, clearing up the story? It's, the, I feel like there's often a narrative, oh, it's not, it's not my problem, it's, it's her problem. Well, I think there's actually a lot of really exciting things that are going on. Yeah, that people, yeah. And I think, um, you know, so people are resisting in a lot of ways, and they're doing a lot of really good things. I mean, there's the whole um, the blockade that was just happening in Seattle um, because they have all the drilling equipment that's going to be a staging ground there in Seattle for uh, starting to drill in the Arctic. Um, how many of you were at the People's Climate March last year? Uh, yeah, I thought that was a really important uh, inspiring moment to demonstrate that there is a popular movement growing in the United States around climate. And, um, and, a, and the result of that was that I think it also opened the eyes of political leadership. You know, the ban on fracking here in New York took place shortly after that. Um, some of the changes, I think, in policy here even in the city of New York were the result of organizing that had been going on for, for years by groups in, in, the, in the state and the city. And the People's Climate March kind of created um, this impulse, I think, for political leaders um, to start moving on things. And so and I think it also inspired other people, not just here in the United States, but um, in other parts of the world as well. So I think we're seeing more and more um, just people organizing themselves. And, um, and I know Pablo can speak to a lot of the, uh, different examples in other parts of Asia and other parts of the world as well. But that's ultimately what it's going to take. It's going to take popular movement. Uh, to be able to uh, make our leaders accountable, but we're seeing it in different places. And then there are examples of people just um, doing different things in their own communities. Uh, we, you know, I work in our alliance with groups that are doing things in Richmond, California. They live in the shadow of the, one of the largest Chevron refineries, and yet they're organizing these coalitions with, with solar cooperatives, with local urban agricultural groups, and, um, and other organizations to basically change um, the economy of that city. Uh, that's going to be a long-term fight, but yet they're doing a lot of really great things. They just won an election last year where they swept the city council and the mayor's office, even though Chevron paid millions of dollars uh, for the opposing candidates 
the popular slate won there. So there's just so many things I think uh, that are starting, we're starting to see that have also been going on for a long time. Uh, coalitions that are happening between indigenous people and rural uh, white communities that hadn't happened before. Um, so there's just a, there's a lot of potential. And so if there's anything, I think there's, uh, for people, that it's just to get active. And I think finding that place that's meaningful uh, for you in terms of where you can make a difference, and it can be within your own community that that can happen, um, and we can start putting pressure on political leadership and showing different ways that, uh, that we can move forward. So. Uh, and do you feel that, and even local, do you, do you feel, is your opinion that the best action to take, even if it's a micro level, very local level, has to do with changing the opinion of our leadership? I mean, it seems like the, 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 the main goal here has to do with whether it's city, state, or our country. But that's the main obstacle here. I think it's changing, um, it's changing policy. It's also getting good leadership. <laughs> so that's part of the so we should challenge also. I'm not joking, we should run for the city council. We should run Yeah, absolutely. It's supporting good leadership, people that are accountable to the community and not to uh, profits. That's, that's part of the struggle. It's a long-term struggle. And it's also demonstrating that there are, are alternatives. And, and it can happen at different levels, too. It doesn't have to be necessarily even your city council. I mean, it can be your public utilities commission. There are so many ways School boards. There are ways to engage politics that are even um, that are even closer to home and more immediate that can have an impact even on this question of climate. So, getting your school district. Greenpeace is doing an interesting campaign in two school districts in North Carolina to get them to trans uh, transition 100% renewable energies. You know, we got school districts to transition to local agriculture systems, and um, you know, getting more public transportation provided for students. Things like that start to make a difference and be um, kind of a, a beacon of, of, of hope for bigger things for us to be able to do. The reality is in the United States, getting a New Deal program um, is going to, right now, it's going to be tough. Um, so we have to find places where we can demonstrate scale and impact and ultimately change national politics as well. And just to add to this, you, did, you said something about hope, which I think is very important. I think we have to be careful about not just being against something, but being for something. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot easier and uh, rewarding to organize about, about something positive than to organize about um, something negative. So all the ways in which we can have you know, small impacts um, that are like if we organize towards making something happen that creates something new, I think it's uh, uh, very, very positive and, and more empowering than maybe than uh, when we always try to, um, uh, you know, knock down the wall. Mm -hmm. Even though that's part of that's also part of it, but um, <coughs> I think sometimes it may be easier to knock down the wall with uh, positive actions than just with resisting actions. Mm -hmm. Speaking of positive actions, could you talk a little bit, Pablo, about the, the law of the rights of mother? Uh, some of us may know, but I, I don't know. Well, yes, uh, this the law is based on a declaration, that's the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth, that was drafted in this People's World Conference that took place in Cochabamba, and then months later was adopted uh, with some changes, uh, uh, but not military, not at all, as the law of Bolivia. This, the idea of this law is, in a way, a revolution, like what happened when Copernico and Galileo said, the Earth is not the center of the universe, it is the sun. Because what the law is saying is humans are not the center. We are part of nature. So we need to recognize that if we are only part of nature, part of Mother Earth, we have rights, Mother Earth has rights. And we need to build a legal system that preserves the rights of humans and also the rights of nature in order 
that we help to restore the balance in our Earth system. So, the, our, our goal, and we did it, was to bring that uh, to the UN uh, and to begin a movement, like the civil rights movement here, you know, our movement for rights of women to vote, we think that we're in a moment like that. We get rights, but this time, for Mother Earth, for nature. It's just the beginning, I would say, in the case of Bolivia. We have the law. Now we are fighting in Bolivia. One of the reasons that I'm not in the government is because I want to make that a reality. I want to implement that law. And if you want to implement that law, and you want to really follow what it says, you cannot at the same time promote an, an economic model based on extractivism. Because that is in contradiction. So, the situation in Bolivia and also in Ecuador, because Ecuador has this also in its, con in its constitution, is that it's a process that happened in, in, in Bolivia and Ecuador that comes from indigenous people, gets rid of neoliberal governments, puts in place new governments, with new ideas, these new ideas uh, are adopted at constitutional level, legal level, but then those governments are trapped in the logic of power. They want to stay in the government, and in order to stay in the government, they need to find ways to get money faster and sooner, because the next election is in two years. And how do you get money easy through extractivism? It's the fastest way through industry, through agroecology. It's a process. So you will have, in the case of Bolivia and Ecuador, a flashback. Uh, and now there is a struggle. How are we are going to implement that? I'm going back to Bolivia, and one of my ideas is that we need to move now from theory to legal recognition to reality in the practice. Uh, I'm sure that if we address climate change, so there are two possibilities. Of it. We can, I, I understand your, your approach to the optimist, but I prefer to be realistic. This story has two endings. And one ending is with life, not only humans, in a much different way than we have ever seen. But if we're going to succeed, we have to change the relation with Mother Earth. And do you remember, you said that the, the law of the rights of Mother Earth began at this moment. And do you, do, you, do you remember the moment when that idea began to stir at that conference? I'm, no, I'm, I'm curious no, no. about the process of getting it from the conference. No, no already we, we agreed that the conference was going to have that because we put it in the title. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, a good strategy. Yeah. So we said it's the People's World Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth. So, when we invited, who was going to come, knew that there was going to be something in relation to rights of mother. Mm -hmm. I, I must say that the idea, and uh, I can share with you, we are publishing a, a, a book with a chapter on the rights of mother. Really, where did it came from? Uh, not from the indigenous people in Ecuador or in Bolivia. You will find the concept of rights of nature in Thomas Berry here in the US, and deep ecology in Europe. Uh, rights of Mother Earth is uh, the convergence of different trends. Deep ecology, what well, ethics of Thomas Berry, he's the first one to speak about the rights of nature. 
uh, you have the, the other trend comes from the scientific world that begins to speak and say, look, the Earth is a living organism. It is not just a planet. There is those that say it has a spirit. So I would say the rights of Mother Earth come from all of that and the opportunity, of course, and of course the, the, the tradition of indigenous people with Mother Earth. But in indigenous people culture, in the Andean region, the concept of rights doesn't exist. The concept of rights comes from outside. What exists is the biggest respect that you can imagine to nature and to mother. So the mix of all of this was what made possible that first the Constitution in Ecuador had the inclusion of rights of nature and then Bolivia had a law on the rights of Mother Earth. So what's the difference between Mother Earth and nature? For indigenous people, there is a difference. We would say nature is an invention to separate humans from nature. <laughs> we are part of Mother Earth. <laughs> Everything is part of Mother Earth. Nature is a concept. It's an invention too. So we can stand back. Anthropocene, yeah, to have anthropocene too. Here we are, there is the rest. I saw you nodding your head. Well, I remember uh, years ago, we were, uh, in the Southwest, we were organizing networks of uh, communities that were dealing with environmental uh, justice issues. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a number of communities from the Navajo Nation that were dealing with the effects of mining uh, radiation. And, um, and so we have our meetings and we have to have translation. We have people translating in Spanish, people translating in Navajo. And, um, and we found out that there's no translation for the word environment in Navajo language, right? Because it's just, they had a hard time explaining, um, you know, that they just knew that there was something different in the, the world that, that they lived in and seeing the effects on their cattle and, and on the land. But um, just that whole concept about what the environment was was something that was just, it was the world. And so so yes. translating that meeting has a real challenge. Mm -hmm. perspective, mm -hmm. the one perspective that we were talking about, just kind of calling it what it's. So, what, what new vocabulary, what new aesthetics? Yes. 
Yes. Oh, also, uh, oh yeah, the use of new technologies, and that's very interesting because um, it leads to things that could not have happened before. For example, and that have a very direct uh, impact sometimes on the climate change science. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I don't know if many of you saw the movie Chasing Ice, the documentary Chasing Ice. Ice. Chasing Ice, it features um, James Baylog, who is a photographer, and uh, James Baylog has always been a nature photographer, mm -hmm. and what he did, he got interested in glaciers, and he rigged still cameras to take one picture per hour of daylight, and then he installed those cameras near glaciers. Um, he started in Alaska, I think, but they're kind of all over the world now. And then after a year, and so there's a microchip, you know, there's a whole, it's a whole apparatus. And after a year, he went back to retrieve the pictures that have been taken. And then he creates these time-lapse photographies where um, you see, you, you actually see the, the glacier, you know, moving with the seasons, but also retreating um, much faster than, than people expected. And he's create what he calls it, he's, he's creating the, a memory of the land. And this is directly affects um, climate science because scientists cannot, you know, they can take measurement, but they cannot observe this phenomenon um, in real time. So that the, this new technology, like the, the art and the science is merging. There are also artists who are creating uh, what they call environmental remedial art. So they're creating pieces that are um, art pieces, but that are meant to uh, help an ecosystem recover from certain damage. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, so there's one person, he, um, he creates these sculptures that are put at the bottom of the ocean to help um, reefs, coral reefs heal. So the, the reefs have somewhere to attach and then can replenish. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also another, there's a duo, um, two artists who are working together who are creating these um, braided um, sort of branch structures that are put uh, in, uh, in, in a national park, I think it's in the, it's in the Midwest, and it's to help with erosion and some problems that they're having there. So there's, there's definitely, um, th there, there's, there's a lot of reasons in that way to be hopeful, I find. Does anyone know the name of the visual artist who does the uh, vegetable gardens in the front, your people's front yards? Do you know who I'm talking about? That is, uh, I saw a presentation that his, his whole art project was encouraging people in suburban neighborhoods, instead of doing small vegetable gardens in their backyards, keeping their front yard neat and tidy and having to water their plants to move their vegetable garden to their front yard mm -hmm. so that you're actually watering. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's controversial in some of these neighborhoods because it's it looks messy and unsightly, but um, but this whole project is to kind of transform. So it's interesting to think about aesthetics and action there. Yeah. Is there are there any art artworks that have been a part of your organizing and policy making? I mean, I know I know many of these marches, of course, are art making. That's big goals. Well, we're we're actually doing this project this summer, mm -hmm. and we're doing a project called the Summer of Our Power as a, one of the follow-ups to the march that uh, our organization's doing. But it's actually a quilt project that we're doing that's going to travel through three tributaries uh, from the West Coast, uh, through the center of the country, and on the, on the East Coast. And it's going to pass from community to community, where uh, communities are organizing for this just transition. And they're going to develop a section of the quilt that's going to be constructed uh, in the Gulf Coast for the commemoration of um, Hurricane Katrina on August 29th. So it's both a symbol of the, um, a visual symbol of the, the work that's going on for a just transition in these different communities, and at the same time, a uh, symbol of solidarity for uh, the peoples of the Gulf Coast that went through Katrina 10 years ago. So, so that's, that's one way that we're looking at it. We're also looking at different ways we can promote music, Hip hop and things like that that help with this. I just think there's a lot of work to be done around um, stories that promote values of, um, of uh, reciprocity and, and commons and um, community and um, also fairness and justice. I think I think that's still something that's very much ingrained in U.S. society, even in some of the you know even if you watch like old westerns. 
they're still in those storylines, like overcut maybe like a big rancher or something like that. Even though you get like the rugged individualism and Clint Eastwood driving in, usually it's about fighting some bigger power that's oppressing like a community in some way. So I do think that's still part of the narrative within the United States that that also has to be promoted, that sense of justice and fairness and overcoming um, overcoming power <laughs> So things like that, I think, are important in terms of developing those stories and those narratives and, and promoting ways that people are being resilient, that where they're resisting, and also being the vision and hope. I think those are things that we can, we can promote for our art. It's also a place to create a conversation that uh, is away from the, the politics in the way. Um, there, there was a, there's a theater company in upstate New York who, she told me, the woman who runs the theater company told me that their community, her community was dealing with fracking. And um, because of that, they couldn't talk about climate change because there were people who were letting the company, um, you know, use their, their land and then people who were against it. So it was very polarized. So what she did, because it's a lot of farmland, is um, she created this big theater project about the weather because everybody talks about the weather. <laughs> so she created a space where there could be a conversation where people could, could get together and talk to each other without, um, you know, and then maybe some of the stuff would, would come in here and there, but the frame was, was made as such so a conversation could, could happen, while otherwise if she had addressed um, climate change directly, it would have been too polarized and it would have been a, a little bit of a fight. I'm also thinking about, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I love the thought of these plays and projects, and I, and I start to think about um, the audience and the number of audiences that have been able to reach, and, and then I think about um, maybe uh, people in cities who aren't inclined to go see art or may not be drawn to a, um, to a march. And one thing that I feel in Louisiana that has at least started to I, I think reach a broader audience is just simply um, uh, different organizations that deal with our coastal erosion issue, which the Louisiana coast is washing away. And um, uh, for, for a number of reasons, having to do with trying to control the Mississippi River, um, having to do with oil drilling through the wetlands. Uh, and a lot of the maps that you see, if you buy a map now, it looks like there's a lot more land at the base of Louisiana than there really is because the maps haven't, haven't been redrawn or the maps have not been republished. And so now I find a lot of news stories and environmental action groups are actually showing the actual map, which is completely startling when you see how little how little land is left. And, and I feel like sometimes just thinking of um, quick snapshots, quick visuals that can reach many people to start snapping them into just awareness, because I feel like it's so easy not to be aware or just to hear a word like climate change
I think that is the anthropocentric that we have to get out because it's thinking on us. But what about the life that we are destroying? It's not only about human. The species that, not in the future, but we already have uh, exterminated. The planet will be, will continue, it's true, but it will not continue with the kind of life, and when I speak about life, I don't mean only human life that exists. And this life, the conditions for this, took around 4,000 million years <laughs> to, to happen. So life didn't exist from the beginning. And what is at risk is not only us humans, it's life, life as we know it. I think they will continue life, but it will be different. We are entering an, an extinction, not only of the human species, but of life. I, I think that what we have to do is not only for the sake of humans. That's why I, I think we have to change our perspective. And we have to think from the perspective from the other perspective. And uh, I think it's difficult because we all have been uh, thought in that way, but uh, I think we need to do it if we want to address the issue. Yeah, I was, um, about a year and a half ago, I got the opportunity to travel through Micronesia and um, spent some time in my homeland in Guam. And, um, there's, for Guam, for many years, there's been this big problem, sometimes they even joke about it, about this brown tree snake that was brought in um, on a military transport. And basically that population just exploded on the island and basically wiped out the bird population on the island of Guam. More recently, there's been an infestation of um, what's called the rhinoceros beetle. And the rhinoceros beetle doors into coconut trees and eats them from the inside out. And within the last couple of years, um, from the time I went two years before to just uh, actually we went again in December, um, there are huge areas of Guam where the coconut trees are just dead. And, um, and then we found out that there are seven species of coral that are on the endangered species list in Guam. For the first time ever in its history, because of the acidification of the oceans, that are happening because of climate change. Um, so the balance of the island, and the irony, by the way, of the way the remedy for the rhinoceros beetle is birds, which were completely wiped out by, by the snakes. So, so it's, it's almost like this vicious cycle now of where the island is becoming out of balance. And more and more it's becoming out of balance because those things that kept it in balance are disappearing more. And then traveling to an island like Majuro in like the Marshall Islands, which is basically, it's a natural. So when you're landing on the island, it's like water on this side and water on that side. And it's one road back and forth. And you think about how for centuries people have managed to live on, um, on those islands, very tiny islands, for centuries. But with the, the new economy that was brought in and the mil military, that was brought in, there was a whole new culture and economy that was imposed on the island. And it's now, in a lot of ways, it's a slump. It's very poor, um, you know, no jobs, um, I mean, there's, there's, there's no economy. And, um, and people survive by what's brought in. So most of the islands in that region uh, have two weeks worth of food. They say that are either brought in by ships or planes. Uh, that includes even Hawaii, that includes Guam. And so the fact, to me, it, it was just the stark reality of how uh, these islands were just a microcosm of what's happening everywhere. That things are becoming out of balance and people have found a way for many generations to be able to live in that balance and harmony with um, their environment, with nature. And all of that now is starting to disappear and we're seeing signs of it everywhere. So to me, and, and just to think of the beauty in those places, how that's disappeared. Um, and so for me, the restoring, to me, is about that balance. It's how do we restore that balance and then we find ways to restore that? Because it's true. We can't survive, we can't be separated.
from our environment and from nature. It's, it's, uh, we are part of that. And so yeah, the earth will go on, but we won't be on it. And a lot of life and the beauty that exists around us is going to disappear. Mm -hmm. Seems like a kind of perspective shift from when we went from the ego, the world was flat to the world was round. When suddenly everyone can re readjust and reorient. And what is the thing that is going to be allow us to reorient, to see us as part of the system instead of outsiders? Um, we now have time for exactly two questions <laughs> from the audience. Melanie has her hand up. I know, we can see. We'll wait and see if there's any. There are two. So why don't we, can we do Melanie and? No, can we do that? Okay, you can do two. Okay, so let's do these two. Yes, uh, we can start with you, sir. What's your name? Okay. My name is Michael, and uh, I just, uh, I actually, this is one of those terrible moments where I'm not sure this is a question, but I wanted to really weigh in on the, about what's good that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there's a question that's inherent in it, but mm -hmm. in New York City, I think it's important for all of us to realize that over the last five years, New York City has actually reduced its carbon emissions. So we are a success story, and we have done that not by accident and not because of the recession, but in a very deliberate way because of the deployment of plans at the mayoral level. <clears throat> and that is still continuing, and we actually have a very progressive city council right now that is very invested in energy efficiency. I just really wanted to make that point because it's, it's something that as New Yorkers we should really understand and we should be attentive to. Um, and then one other thing is that solar has been the fastest growing industry in the U.S. in the last three years. It has outstripped every other industry. And I also think that well, it's just important to take that in. So I, I'm really sorry that I used time not to ask the question, but I just felt like that needed to be said. I, I wonder if the question might have to do with the solar energy. No, definitely the one of the key issues is to move from dirty energy to renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, solar energy is uh, definitely one of the of the key sources. And there are very successful experiences, especially in Germany. Um, and we have to keep moving. No? Now it's not that I want, don't want to recognize how important it is, but sometimes we think that it's possible to address climate change only by changing from dirty energy to renewable energy. And that is not true. But that is one part of the issue. The issue of consumption, for example, Europe has reduced greenhouse gas emissions. But studies show that the amount of uh, carbon dioxide that they consume but now is being produced in other countries like China maybe, is almost the same or more than what it was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So you can reduce your, the consumption of renewable energy but if you don't reduce your patterns of consumption of product you're outsourcing the emissions outside. So now we are only focusing on the emissions that I have in my uh, city or, or lo local community. But what are the emissions that we are creating abroad? And this is a problem. Uh, so we have to address that issue. So uh, if we don't address all of these levels, we can get trapped in that illusion that we're doing good while well, we are promoting investment on coal in other parts, like Sweden. I was in a, in a debate with the Minister of Environment, and she recognized we are reducing, but we are investing now the state-owned company in a new uh, coal plant in Wattenfallen in Germany. So, this time, we have to look at all these aspects. Because the loophole, at the end, what happens is 
that because there is this issue. Okay, what are the global emissions? Have they declined or no? They keep increasing. So what is happening that even though we have such a successful story in New York or such a successful story in Germany, how come globally we are getting worse, worse, and worse? And I think it is also important to highlight that we are getting worse. Because otherwise, we believe that we are addressing the, the problem. <laughs> and we are not. I mean, we are doing our part that we do locally, but globally, the problem is not getting there. Uh, did you have a question? Well, kind of a contribution to understanding the Chinese Texas and uh, last month traveled to Cedar Rapids, the Iowa, and participated in Al Gore's um, climate leadership, communist reality leadership training. And um, I found it to be an incredible experience um, uh, and uh, wondered what you all, maybe I'm, here's my question, what you all, how you all react to that, that campaign. Um, and just for y'all who don't know, um, maybe y'all do know, Al Gore's been doing this leadership, um, climate reality leadership training program for people over around the world and has gotten sort of an army of about 7,000 people now it, um, trained. He trains you, it's him, and he does it. And that's really quite an amazing thing. He spends the whole whole day with you, it's a three-day training. He really does the training one day, a full day with you. And um, it's a real compelling, amazing day. Um, and they're working toward June 18th, there's going to be this live, uh, live Earth concert globally, all these simultaneous concerts on June 18th, leading to the Road to Paris campaign that's coming up with, uh, to the meetings that you all mentioned. And I just wondered, he didn't come up today, um, and, but in a way, he, he, he and the community that he's creating is doing the kind of reaction that you were asking for, but there has been a community that has created a reaction to a situation. Michael, what does your organization have to do with Al Gore? We haven't actually worked much with the door uh, of Al and his, his campaign. Um, I'm familiar with the, uh, the concerts that, that are coming up in the Road to Paris. Uh, I met some of the folks that um, uh, the organizers of that. I'm not familiar though with the training, like how you should, you, you should be on those panels. My criticism of the Iowa training was they were not, they were all, about, it was very white. The next training is going to be in Miami, and I just assume it's going to be much more diverse. But the, the, um, the, my, the Iowa City was, I mean, I've written about it already. It was just a, a, a abysmal in terms of diversity. Uh, did you plan Hi, uh, thanks so much. I, I had a question about uh, environmental rights, and um, I'm gay and I do art that sort of does peace advocacy, so as a gay man, I think, you know, sometimes my gay rights had to be fought for, but then when you think about my art and the fact that it talks about peace, I feel like it is a little more controversial <coughs> because to be a peace activist is technically illegal in America. And then when I think about animal rights, to protect animal rights, even though we protect animals, it's still illegal in America. And then when I think about plant rights, I wonder what rights do plants have when Monsanto is patenting and owning plant life? And then when I think about water, I'm wondering what kind of rights do we have to water when California is in drought and people in Detroit who live in the city don't have that. So, when you break down um, natural elements that are not human, that we as humans have a right to, where is a relationship to these rights? And how are we fighting for these rights that are of nature, of the environment? You know, one of the things uh, we used to talk about in the environmental justice movement is that you can't separate them out. Like, these issues are all connected. And, uh, and that's, I think it's, it's a problem in the United States generally, uh, just the fragmentation of all the different issues and how they're viewed as separate and how we're all working on them separately. And 
yet we don't have a movement really that brings all of them together um, and sees them as interconnected. And, um, and I think that was part of uh, why we thought the, the People's Climate March, for instance, was important, was because we needed, we recognized that we needed to expand beyond just the traditional environmentalists, climate justice activists, even the environmental justice movement. Right? We had to bring, so that's why you saw immigrant rights activists, that's why you saw um, more labor unions, that's why you saw gay rights activists. I mean, the women's organizations, we had to expand and be uh, a movement really that's needed in the United States, not just about climate, but about social justice um, and, uh, and rights in general. So, so I think uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, those are, they seem like contradictions because we don't actually have a perspective in terms of how to walk them. May I say something? You know, I don't know, because it's different to speak about environmental rights and rights of nature. The right to an environment is a human right. You know? And many constitutions in the world have it. It's the right of humans to a healthy environment. But when we enter the other side, that is the rights of nature, it is the right of a river to be free out of pollution is the right of a seed to not be gen genetically modified. So in the rights of Mother Earth or rights of nature approach, the ban on GMOs is not because it, it's unhealthy humans, it's because you're violating the rights of nature, of the seed itself. So, Many ask us, but does that mean that I cannot cut a tree or that I cannot eat a fish? One thing is to eat a fish or to cut a tree. Another thing is to dismantle an entire forest or uh, exterminate an entire species of fishes. So in a rights of nature approach, the, the relation with nature means that there are certain limits and certain vital cycles that we have to preserve, not only for us, but for the Earth system as a whole. Um, let's do, I, I'm, I'm breaking the rules. Quick question, and Melanie, then you, and then we'll wrap up. It, it's really quick, and perhaps it's um, a little personal, but I'm, I'm truly curious. You spoke about reducing um, consumption, and um, I'm, I'm curious to know what each of you, what, uh, what are some of the choices each of you as individuals mm. makes in your life to reduce your consumption, to do your part personally? For example, waste. Yeah. Because thirty percent of food is thrown away. And that is something personal that you have to do. But there are many others in terms of transportation, in terms of the how often you change of your phone. Or are you going to be trying to be uh, the last fashion or not? So, yes, definitely. It's a matter of what you do, but also how do you create rules in the economy that you know, don't promote that you buy the next gadget that is on the street? Because otherwise, it would be impossible to, to succeed if we have an economy that wants you to consume and consume more. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I live in Albuquerque, so public transportation is, um, it's rare when we see a bus, but it's, it's getting better, I mean, we have like the train now that goes from Albuquerque to Santa Fe and all that, so, but that's, that's one challenge, is, is being able to get around. Waste is probably the most immediate thing that we can definitely do in terms of waste separation and recycling and all those kind of things, and, and it's actually been shocking to have family of five, and just to see how much plastic and paper and all of that one family goes through. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, the other thing that I think is important is, is also learning to be resourceful, right? is um, you know, making things last. And 
That was one of the big things uh, that I saw in Cuba that always struck me, is to see like cars from the 1950s in new condition, and lawnmowers from the 1930s that are still functioning. It's because they also take care of um, you know, those, those kind of resources and make them last. And I think that's something also for us. Everything is made so disposable. Yeah, and even like a, you know the, the iPhone charger is like the, that plastic becomes unraveled in a few months because they know you've got to pay thirty dollars in six months to get another one. So it's uh, it's I think it's learning and teaching ourselves to be more resourceful and ways that we can be more self uh, self sustainable uh, as much as we can and make things last. Um, some of the stuff I do is very intentional, and some is by default because you know being an artist. I live on very little money, so I can't buy the new phone and the new this and the new that. So it becomes a, it's actually a restriction that sometimes I'm happy to have because it keeps me, um, it keeps me, like it prevents me from even having the desire to go get the next thing. Yeah, someone was teasing me recently about seeing pictures of me from five years ago where I have the same clothes. <laughs> Example when you build dam, you know, at certain, to build one dam, a small dam in a river, yeah. for electricity is one thing. But if you build ten dams, you're going to affect the the life of the river in such a way that the river is going to die. So that means that the issue of rights has to do with the economy. The economy cannot develop in a way that will affect the vital cycles of nature, in this case of the river, or of the forest. I come now from, from Thailand, and I'm producing a short video on the story of uh, the Khmer Empire in Cambodia. It was an empire that hosted one million people. It lasted for 300, 400 years, and it collapsed. Why did it collapse? 
It has the most greatest uh, canals and hydrologic system, but they began to cut too much the trees. They, the deforestation spread. So at some point, they were unable to control the floods. And the floods began to destroy their hydrologic system, and therefore they, didn't have, they weren't able to have enough water for their agriculture, and that meant that people had to leave the city. So enough experiences are in many parts of the world of what are the limits for a certain economy, for a certain kind of projects to be developed. I think that is a key component that most of the time in different kind of projects and planning of governments is not taken into account. And just one last thing in relation to what you said. I think that we all begin to agree that capitalism, we have to overcome capitalism to address climate change. But the key question is how to overcome capitalism? Because it's more easy to identify it than to get out of the logic of capital. That's why I asked that question. Because it was contained in that radical idea that sports are radical way for us to run out of a lockdown. Control. The society has to take control over this means of production. We have to transform some, some of them. Because otherwise, it can happen what happens in the case of Bolivia. We begin to be addicted, more addicted even to extractive industries. So now it's Bolivian oil. It's not anymore owned by private companies. But we don't get out of that logic of extracting in order to make more profit. To get out of that logic, for me, it requires a different kind of democracy. The solution for this economic problem is a democratic issue. It's not a rule of economy. Only a very vibrant society that is very participative will be able to shape an economy that goes out of the logic of capital. It is not through only state measures that are needed that you will overcome capitalism. It has been shown that it's much more complex than that. The vibrant and participatory part seems crucial. And I, I, I'm, I'm beginning to even get, to get skeptical of some of the advertising campaigns that I see for green energy and these, these catchwords that are very general that can make you feel very self-satisfied about certain sort of things. Do, do you know what I mean? Like I, I'm just, how to get specific about these actions that we can take about what is actually working rather than what is just a band-aid, you know, feels just crucial and connected to the um, being hypnotized by, by capitalism as well. So how do we get unhypnotized? That's it will be the next discussion. <laughs> um, the last one last burst of a question. We've talked a little bit about hope. Is there one last thing you can give us about what gives you hope? Or or maybe what makes you wake up energized? To deal with this issue. I can say one thing, and that will be the time. Uh, one thing that gives me hope is colleagues of mine that I see that are creating uh, works of art that are um, participatory and deal directly with 
uh, environmental issues that are personal to them, but that are being, um, so that they are staying true to a very radical and experimental aesthetic. And the two that I will point to is a, a dance piece called Shore by Emily Johnson, who, is, um, who lives in Minneapolis but is a native of Alaska. And it was just pr produced by New York Live Arts. And it, um, it, it included a performance, but also a whole series of community actions and a series of storytelling, um, all connected to um, local environmental issues here in New York, but she adapts it for every city that she goes to. And the other is a piece called Cry You One, which is created by some of my colleagues in New Orleans, uh, Art Spot Productions and Mondo Bizarro, which is about, they created it and performed it on the levee in St. Bernard Parish, south of New Orleans. And it's very much addressing, it was a, a, the performance was a procession down the levee where you could see um, a bayou that was once um, alive, but now in many ways is dead because of saltwater intrusion has killed all the trees. So you actually saw the performance and the effects of this environmental disaster. Uh, but when they produced the play in other cities, they adapted to the local needs. Um, and so I'm, I'm seeing this more and more in the, um, the experimental performing arts community of using ambitious forms to talk about these problems out in the world. No, of course not. Well, what do I get my? I'm an optimist, hmm. but I prefer to call the things by their name. Mm -hmm. Why am I an optimist? Because when I look back in my country uh, 20 years ago, everything was being privatized. Yeah. Um, to speak against neoliberalism was, what are you saying? You're a joke. You're speaking that you're going to change the situation, you can't do it. And it was possible. And it was possible to recover those resources that were privatized, to have back those public services, to have a, a, a law now that speaks about rights of Mother Earth. Now, is everything on the good track? No. And I prefer to say it very clearly. Because that means Okay, the next stage is if we were able to deal with the economy, we have to deal with now with our contradictions. But we say one thing, but we do another thing. And if we did it before, we're going to do it. I believe in humanity, and I have seen people uh, really come together, and when they really grab an idea, they move and they can change everything. So I believe really that the people's power. Yeah, I have, I have a hard time answering the question, not because um, it's hard to find. There are just so many things. You know, I mean, there's definitely work that people are doing this groups here in New York, like Uproads and you know, New York City Environmental Justice Alliance groups that I know that I work with that, that uh, are doing really inspiring things. And I see that all over. Um, but sometimes it's just a matter of just like if you just stop and you know and you just you're outside and you stop and you just take a breath and you, you will find something that will inspire you. Whether it's kids playing or laughing, whether it's you know just things that you see in terms of just the animals and how they interact with each other. There's just so many things in the world that if we just stop to so just appreciate it, that give inspiration and hope and. Um, yeah, it's really there's there's just too many things that I see like, constantly to so fight. So there's no shortage. And along the same lines, um, I believe we're hardwired for uh, survival, and so we have it within us to face the biggest challenge. And so, and and one of our most useful tools, I think, is creativity. And I see it in the art world, and I see it outside of the art world too, with you know startup companies and people who are creating um, vertical gardens, or um, now these windmills that have no blades. And um, it seems like the bigger the problem, the more the creativity, the, our creativity is called into play. And um, whenever I see people be creative, I, that gives me a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. Creativity, 
stop and notice people's power outdoor experimental theater. <laughs>